Hi everyone and welcome to episode 69 of the Talk is Cheap show. Hope you're all well, healthy and COVID-3. Thanks to everybody for tapping in today, man. Really appreciate it. Hopefully we've got another great show lined up for you today. I really hope you do enjoy it. I'm sure you will. But before we go any further, it would be remiss of me not to start by introducing my co-host, counterpart and collaborator in chief, the celebrated, the candid, the charismatic, the cavalier, the charming, the clever, the compelling, the congenial, the always cool and always classy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big digital round of applause for Curtis Shaw of Curtis Shaw TV and how's we say, bro? Do you know what? That gets better every week, man. I have to applaud. <laughs> I'm going to have to transfer Western <laughs> Union or sort of I owe you a check for that. <laughs> but you know what? You know what it is, bro? I'm sort of running out of superlatives for you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You must be reading dictionaries. Like, let me write down all the... <laughs> hey, man. No, 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 I'm I'm good, man. I must admit, that's one of my favourite parts of the show, man. But listen, bro, how you been doing, man? No, I've been good, man. You know what? Do you know what? I, you know, like we're we're on our way out of lockdown soon, aren't we? You know, football obviously at our levels coming back in the next week or so. So things are, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, isn't there? You know, I think everyone's yeah. looking forward to spring and summer getting back to normal. And yeah, it's it's good, man. It's good. Can't complain. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. So have you had that jab yet, bro? That vaccine? Nah, bro? nah. They can stay away from me, man. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want any conspiracy theories, no? No, no, but I'm just, you know, I'm in mm. no rush. No, I see what you mean. I had mine yesterday. Uh, I must admit I had a slight little reaction in my left arm uh, okay. where I had the jab, obviously. But you know what? It was, like, minimal. It was just a slight discomfort. Um, so, hey, man, I, I think, listen, in time, Pretty much all of us need to get this done if we're going to beat this virus, man. So uh, I hope you rethink. And, uh, yeah, uh, listen, I'm, I'm not saying I won't do it. I just, you know, you know what it's like. You grow up in that yeah. Caribbean household, man. They, yeah. they, they always think there's some homegrown method that can do, you know, drink some ginger tea or something. You know? <laughs> some <One> sesame. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know how it is. So. But when I was younger, um, well, Anything that went wrong with us, my mum and dad used to say, you put some beer on, funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, them home yeah. stuff, man, yeah. But anyway, moving on, man. So how are you enjoying the international break so far, bro? Oh, man. Like, it honestly feels like we haven't played for, like, two months. Like, it's only been a week, less than a week. It's funny, when Arsenal are here, sometimes we complain and... They've dropped points. They're winding you up. But when they're not there, you're like, yo, get back as soon as possible, man. I mean, I didn't even watch the England game, to be honest. I just had no interest in it. I saw I saw the goal highlights after, but nah, man. It, 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 a game like that, that's pretty much all you're going to need to watch. Yeah, it? Because, that's uh, it. You know, let's be honest. Um, I hear in Odegaard's picked up an injury uh, for Norway while on international break. Yeah, apparently it's not serious. I know the, the coach said he's in contention for the next game. He trained yesterday right. as well. So uh, I, I think he slightly rolled his ankle right. um, playing for Norway. First game as captain as well for Norway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, yeah, uh, um, the guys can stay injury-free, man, because uh, we're going to touch on it later, but we've got some big games coming up after the international break and yeah. of course we're going to need Odegaard. He's one of our main players. Mm. But... Before we look at that, let's um, look at Arsenal's game. Um, after our last show, it was an away game to West Ham, um, London derby. What can I say, man? A three-all draw. Um, if anything, it was very entertaining. Uh, but the key moments were, let's face it, we got off to absolutely calamitous start. A goal down after 15 minutes, wonder strike by Jesse Lingard, of all people. Two minutes later, another goal, um, quick free kick, West Ham took. Uh, Leno beaten on his near post, it has to be said, by a shot by Boeing. So that's 2-0 down after 17 minutes. We're all looking at each other in the watch log saying, what is this? And then 10 minutes or so later, or less than 10 minutes later, a third goal. Mikel Antonio bullying um, David Luiz in the air. 
uh, Susi gets a touch and we're three 0 down after barely half an hour. Mm. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is going on here, man? You know what I mean? But to be fair, um, you've got to give the guys credit. They fought back. They got back into the game. Um, I think it was the 38th minute. Lacazette, great strike. Um, it hits so cheap, goes in. So that's 3-1. So you're thinking, you know what? Um, there's some signs we might get back in the game here. And to be fair to the guys, they played very well. Um, come out for the second half, 61st minute. Good cross by Karen Chambers on the right there. Craig Dawson puts it into his own net, 3-2. 82nd minute, great cross by Pepe. He came on as a sub, putting a great cross. Lacazette heads it in, three all. And at that point, you're thinking, wow, we could actually go on and win this game, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I just want to ask you, man. So do you think that uh, it ended up three all, obviously? Do you think that was a point gained or two points dropped? What's your thoughts? I, I felt like it was two points dropped. And I know being... Look, being 3-0 down and drawing a game against a good side is a point gained from that situation, let's be honest. Like at 3-0, we're not even expecting to get a point. I just think considering the position that we're in and what we need in the Premier League, a point didn't really do anything for us. You know, It didn't make any significant difference no. to our league um, position. And, uh, and we did have the chances to actually go on and win the game, although I have to say West Ham did as well. Antonio, you know, missing from two yards. I think, you know, we called the show last week from the sublime to the ridiculous. I think that game kind of, well, it was the other way around from the ridiculous to the sublime. It was like... It was probably our first half of the season, really, you know, up until about December. That was kind of how we was playing. And then from Christmas was what happened after we scored the goal. Um, it was a great game for a neutral, you know, a neutral watching that must have really enjoyed it. Um, but it, it kind of summed Arsenal up. We're, we're a bit all over the place at times, but at times we're really good. I think, listen, I've criticised Arsenal a lot this season and the manager, but I do have to give them credit um, for coming back from 3-0 down against West Ham. Uh, I just I just don't think they should have put themselves in that position. I think good teams, when you go 1-0 down, you put up that brick wall for 10, 15 minutes and say, right, we're 1-0 down. We haven't started well, but we don't go 2-0 down, 3-0 down. We kind of capitulate for 30 minutes and the game can get away from you. I think, I think West Ham were there to be beaten. That was what was so frustrating about it. I don't think... You look at the second goal, we gave them that goal. You know, three players turn their back on a free kick. It's, and then Leno gets beat at the near post. The third goal, like you said, Antonio just roughing man up. <laughs> Suchek's unmarked. The, the first goal we have to give credit for, you know, Lingard, he always seems to score against us. It was a brilliant goal. But we've got to cut out those mistakes. If we can cut those mistakes out, we've got a decent team, but too many errors. So... Listen, great credit for the comeback. They do deserve credit for that, but we shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. So overall, I would say um, two points dropped, in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's an interesting perception on the game. I mean, listen, man, I mean, when we went 3-0 down, I, I was absolutely forlorn. I was really thinking we could be on the end of a good idea. Then. And mm. so, as you quite rightly said, uh, to turn that around from where it was is, um, you know, I mean, it's a great performance. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you slightly. I think that was a point oh. game because yeah. every time you go 3 0 down, yeah, your team in the Premier League, um, that team would be expected to win mm. unless a couple of men sent off and whatever. So to claw that back, um, and we could, like you said, we could have won the game, so could they have done. So I actually thought a draw was a fair result in the end, but when you consider that you're 3-0 down after 30 odd minutes um, to come yeah. back and get a draw. Okay, so let's face it, we're standing on mugs. They're a good team. They're above us in the league. Um, and you know what I mean? They're a very capable and well-organized outfit. Um, so yeah, I, I would consider it a point game. But moving on from there, I mean, um, the talking points were uh, plenty afterwards. Um, I'm looking at that game and I'm thinking to myself, and I've titled the show this, were Arsenal against West Ham, was that performance? Did that sum up Arsenal's season? Did that performance against West Ham sum up Arsenal's season? In that yeah. we were so dreadful in the first 30 minutes, but then we excelled later on in the game. So it's almost like you've gone from zero to 100 
in one game, you know. So um, yeah, yeah, that that's going to be the title of the show, and I was interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I don't know Mikel Arteta has said in his post-match uh, conference that um, Arsenal's giving him sleepless nights at the moment. And <laughs> we, do, we do tend to be a bit bipolar like that, aren't we? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what's your thought? Why, why does that happen on a regular basis to us, where we will be outstanding, whether the, when we start off the game well and then fade towards the end, or we have a dreadful start and then we come back? Why can't we seem to keep our concentration and manage a game for 90 minutes? I think it comes down to a lack of quality in certain areas. Although I think we have got a good team, I think there are glaring weaknesses in this Arsenal team. And and not only that, you can have players that aren't as good, but we've got very erratic players. You know, you look at players like Louise, Xhaka, Bellerin, just, just as an example. They're players that anything can happen at any given moment, you know. Foul throws, red cards, handball, anything can seem to crop up at any moment. And I think that's what happens with Arsenal. Like at any time, we can just do anything. We've seen over the last couple of weeks, you know, against Burnley, Xhaka kicks the ball against a Burnley player. And against West Ham, they turn their back on a free kick. Concentration is a major part, uh, a major part of sport. Um, in that the best players, the best athletes, their concentration level is at the highest standard. Mm -hmm. um, you can have all the talent, all the ability, but if you can't produce that throughout the whole game, that's where you that's where you fall down. And I think that's mm -hmm. what Arsenal's problem is. I think they can they can perform well for forty five minutes, thirty minutes. They can turn it on, score a couple of goals, but to do it over a ninety minute period seems to be the problem at the moment. I think even Leno. Um, I think Leno had a, has had a pretty good season, but over the last six or seven weeks, man, little errors are starting to creep into his game. Mm -hmm. He was a little bit erratic as well. And um, yeah, that, that's something they need to cut out next season. They need to calm down. And um, David Luiz, like I said, he said after the game that this is a very emotional Arsenal team and that, you know, when they're winning games, they're like, you know, hanging on or if they're behind, they're panicking. They need to calm down a little bit. And I, I think that happens when you've got better players in your team. So I well, think you'll be better next season. Well, listen, you played the game at the highest level. Um, I've got a question for you. I've given this some thought. Now, we've seen in other uh, sporting genres and other professional teams where they do actually employ like a mind coach or yeah. someone to work with uh, the players or the individuals, be what sport it is on working on things like that, concentration levels and focus on that. Um, mm. I don't know if Arsenal do that, but is that something that you would like to see happen at Arsenal? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it'd be good to get, um, try and get in the mind of some of these players, but some of them, I don't think anything um, is going to help them, you know? Uh, I think, you know, obviously when I played, we used to, um, we did a lot of mindset stuff and yoga and all that kind of thing in your mind and stuff. I'm sure at the level that they're at Arsenal, they do things like that, but um, still, it's still down to the player at the end of the day. You can try and help them, but um, you know, if Hector Bellerin's doing foul throws, I'm not sure what a mindset coach can do for that, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it can help, but I, I think ultimately with some of the players, Laurie, they're just not good enough. It doesn't matter what coach you bring in, I, I just think we need a better right back. We need a better centre midfielder to play next to Partey. Mm. I still think potentially another centre back, depending on uh, how good Saliba and Mavropanos come back. So uh, I think, yeah, you can help them, but some of them, I think um, they just need to be moved on. Yeah, I hear that, but I'm going to press you on this a little bit because, um, listen, how do you explain the players? Um, it was a three o'clock kickoff. On a Sunday, so it's not like it was an 11:45 or 12 o'clock kickoff, and they had to travel all the way up to Burnley or Newcastle or something like that. You got a three o'clock game. It's in London. The players have been preparing all week for this game, and I'm at a loss to um, I'm at a loss to think that how can these guys make such a poor and slow start? And it has to be said, it's not the first time this season we've seen this. Not by a long way. Yeah where we just don't turn up for the first 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, find yourself a goal or two down or even a man sent off. And you think it's an uphill battle from there. So mm. I'm thinking, why do we tend to start so slowly? 
Again, I think it falls in line with with the lack of quality in certain areas because, to me, I look at a player just as an example, like a, a Kevin De Bruyne. Kevin De Bruyne is a super talented player, but what separates players like him and your Ronaldo's, your Messi's, it's they turn up so consistently. The demand from themselves is so high that they're not going to just turn up in a game and just stroll through the first 30 minutes. These players, they kind of switch it on and off when they feel like it. It's, it's that lack of, you know, that, that temperament. A lot of them aren't winners at the end of the day. Let's be honest. How many players in this Arsenal team have won major trophies around world football? Not, not too many of them have. Um, and I think that a lot of that comes down to the mentality. The manager can help improve that. Some of them will just naturally have it like born into them. And I think sometimes it comes down to that almost cosy lifestyle that has been at Arsenal over the past few years. It's kind of an easy club to play for because you're not held accountable um, sometimes. You can have two or three bad years at Arsenal, go and have five good games and all of a sudden you're the messiah, you're getting a new contract, everyone loves you. It's sometimes, and you know, I think that that's what it is. The demand has to be higher amongst the whole football mm. club from the owner, the manager, the fans. We have to demand more of the players and get a player that can match with those demands. I think ultimately we're ninth in the league for a reason because we haven't been good enough on the pitch, maybe even off the pitch. So I think, like, like I was saying, I think we've got a team where a lot of these players, yeah, they can turn it on for 30, 40 minutes. They'll either start the game slow and finish well or or vice versa. We haven't seen many games this season where we've played well for 90, 80, 90 minutes. You know, it's always been spells in the game where we're good. Yeah. yeah. Chelsea, West Brom, one or two other spring to mind. But yeah, yeah. It's invariably it's either a, a poor start, yeah, and finish strong, or a good start and we finish poor. So yeah. you know what I mean? But so I'm interested in this because uh, like I said before, like we all know, you've been a professional footballer. You've been in many dressing rooms. So tell the people out there, Curtis, what types of things would the manager typically say to his team to G them up before the start of a game, especially a big game like this? What, what, what's the sort of thing do you think you'll be telling them? Will he be going around to people individually or will he just talk to them collectively? Um, how does it go? I mean, it'll be both, won't it? It'll be trying to tap into people's minds individually and and because, you know, everyone's different. You know, they always say some players need a kick up the backside and some need an arm around them. You've got to figure out what each player needs, but it is very difficult. And that's where you rely on your coaching staff as well, which I think it's, it's a strange situation with the coaching staff because I think throughout the years, we've always kind of known a little bit about the staff and what they do and who's who. I couldn't tell you the names of half of these staff. You know, the guy, I call him Mr. Earpod, the guy who stands up with his earpods in. I mean, we still, we're still all kind of wondering what's he listening to during the game. But, you know, it, it, you need quality staff members around you. And, you know, I'm, I'm still not totally convinced about the staff around him. I think sometimes when you're an inexperienced manager, you need some experienced ma um, coaches around you who've been there and done it to kind of help you as well. Um, so you rely on them, but obviously Arteta is very, you know, he learned off Pep and Pep's very into all that tapping into the mind. So mm. I think Arteta's doing what he can with these players in that sense, but I think he will need a, an influx of new players in the summer who've got more of that mentality. Yeah, you make some good points. There. I mean, I've got to say that with Arteta, say what you want about him, and we said quite a bit about him. And I think, to be fair, we have been fair to him. Yeah. Um, but he strikes me as quite a uh, switched on guy, very meticulous. Um, yeah. He looks like somebody who pays a great amount of attention to detail. So when we keep getting these slow starts, I'm thinking to myself, is no one not like impressing upon the players the need? to keep their discipline at the start of games, make sure they do the basic things right. I mean, you talked about it earlier, that free kick there, they just switched oh. off. There was at least three of them that turned their back and West Ham were in. And then of course, Leno gets beaten on his near post. So, you know what I mean? It's a kind of strange one that we keep falling victim to those kind of unforced errors very yeah. early in a game. And indeed, um, later on in games as well, the concentration can just seem to 
just fall apart rather quickly. So I, I think until those things are addressed, yeah, we are going to find ourselves with these uh, peaks and troughs in terms mm -hmm. of performance, and, and we're not really going to be able to climb the table the way I think we should. Yeah. But moving on slightly then, so following that game, there were a few talking points, um, and I'm going to touch on them. The first one was the performance of our captain, <laughs> uh, Abamir. Yeah. Um, not a good day for him at all at the office, man. And I just wondered, yeah. the, um, there seems to be a clarion call for him to be dropped. Um, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, the, the crazy thing about football nowadays is people people forget very quickly now in football. You know, people don't. No one really cares what you did last season, last week. Now, you know. So I I always like to remind people. You know, Aubameyang has carried this team for over two years on his back. Right. I don't know where we would have finished last season without his goals. You know, we we finished eighth anyway, and he basically won us the FA Cup. He hasn't been good enough this season. There's no doubt about that. He scored nine goals in the Premier League, I think 13 in all comps. I mean, he's our top goal scorer in all competition, although Lacazette's just ahead of him in the league. In his defence, I would say, a lot of the early part of this season, he was misused. We were playing him on the left, but really out wide on the left, hugging the touchline, putting crosses in with his left foot, you know, that's not his game. He's 31 now. I think he needs to play in and around the penalty area. I watched that game against West Ham. I thought he had a poor game, really poor game, um, especially for a player of his standard. But again, has Aubameyang ever been a right winger? You know, we played against West Ham. West Ham have got Cresswell and Ben Rama on that left-hand side. He had Callum Chambers behind him, who doesn't play on a regular basis, who did well. But why would you play a Bamiang on the right? When has a Bamiang ever been successful on the right hand side of a front three? It didn't make sense. And I, and I felt like Arteta shoehorned him into the team. As I've said before, for me at this moment, you pick Lacazette or a Bamiang. You can't pick them both, in my opinion. We've got wingers that are playing well at the moment Pepe, Saka. You don't need to put a Bamiang out wide. You play him through the middle or bench him. Mm. I still think that if Arsenal are going to win the Europa League, which is our biggest, you know, that's our biggest opportunity of success this season, Aubameyang will have to play a key part in that. I've got no problem if people are saying, OK, give Lacazette game time ahead of him at the moment, because I do think Lacazette links up better with those three players behind him, which has been like Smith, Rowe, Odegaard, Saka. Lacazette is is passing and that is is better than Aubameyang. Aubameyang is still the best goal scorer at this football club. I don't care what anyone says. His goals speak for themselves. He's he's broken 20 goals in the league twice at Arsenal. Uh, Lacazette's never scored 15 league goals at Arsenal. And he has had these purple patches before where he's great for a month and we're all raving about him. And then he, he dips off a little bit. I think it's a case of Rather than saying he's better than him, drop him, use him, I think embrace it and say, actually, how many teams in the Premier League have got two strikers of that level who play the game so different where, you know, if one of them isn't working, you can bring the other one on. So I think rather than saying, let's keep playing Lacazette or keep playing Aubameyang, I think manage it on a game-by-game -game basis. You might play a team that play a high line, they're a bit slow at the back, perfect game for a Bamiang speed. You may play a team that sit deep where you need hold-up play, perfect game for Lacazette. So to me, rather than saying, oh, Lacazette's better than a Bamiang, drop him. I think just manage the two of them. And, you know, people forget, as bad as people are saying a Bamiang's been, he rescued us against Benfica. Do you know what I mean? He He's the one who, who scored two in that game, chipped the keeper and scored the header. Uh, he missed chances against the Olympiacos and people were on his back. I get that. But the good thing about Aubameyang, he always gets chances. And I worry more as a striker when I'm not getting chances. Getting chances and missing is probably just a confidence issue. But for me, Aubameyang will get back in form and uh, listen, use both of them in my opinion. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Right, my man, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, here we go. I give a nice, I give a nice long answer. Now you're going to press me for an answer, aren't you? <laughs> so given what you just said, and um, I'm yeah. surmising that is that you see, you're suggesting that the manager may need to look at the opposition 
before deciding whether to play Aubameyang or Lacazette. Now, I hear that, yeah. um, but I'm not sure if Aubameyang will totally buy into that, given that he's the captain and, um, let's face it, he's just signed a big contract where I'm pretty sure he would have been giving some assurances in terms yeah. of saying that they would say, yeah, you're going to play every week. But I'm sure those types of things would have been discussed, regular football and stuff like that. So do you think he will accept something like that from the manager? I mean, if he starts throwing his toys out the pram, mm. which, face it, man, um, you know, he, he's, a, he's a great player and all the rest of it, but he's got an ego as well. Do you think he will be happy to be played on a game-by-game -game basis like that or, or what? No, he won't. He won't. He's got a big ego, hasn't he? And yeah. Also, he knows that he's he's done so much for this team and, and he committed. A, look, let's face it, a lot of players have reached a high level and walked out the door. We've seen it many times, Van Persie, Fabregas, Nasri. I think we are, and I've said this many times, me and you have said it, I think our fans need to appreciate Aubameyang. I've always felt like there's a bit of a barrier between the fans and him rather than just embracing him and saying, you know what, we've got a top quality goal scorer. Having a bad season, yes, but a quality player, you know, when Giroud was there going 15 games without scoring, we were desperate for a player like Aubameyang. Mm. And I think ultimately he's one of them players that, he relies on service. I've said it before. He isn't a guy you can just give the ball to who's going to dribble past five players and bend it in from 30 yards. He needs service the way Jamie Vardy needs service. They're limited. They're, they're quick. They play on the shoulder. They need service. When Arteta decided to give him that new contract on that much money, you've got to build your team around him because you're not going to see the best of him if you don't build your attack around him. I don't feel like this attack is built for a striker like Aubameyang. I think Aubameyang's almost overachieved considering the team and the lack of creativity we've had in this team. So I'm actually not surprised he's hit this situation where he's still not banging goals in as much. What I will say, he scored nine goals in the Premier League. I think we judge... Most strikers in the Prem say, I want to score 20 goals. The best strikers always score 20 plus. I still think Aubameyang will probably score 15 league goals this year which is five off 20, which considering how bad we've been and the fact he hasn't been great, it's still a decent season. If you add on top of that goals in the Europa League, I'm sure he'll go beyond 20 in all competition. So to kind of answer your question, no, I don't think he will be happy if he's rotated, but I think he is still the main man at Arsenal. I have to admit, I think, um, I think ultimately, like you said, he is the captain, he's the top paid player. And, and I think he'll find a way to play himself back into form. And I think if we were playing the Europa League final tomorrow and uh, Mikel Arteta had both of them to choose from, I think Aubameyang would be would be starting in the team. OK, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. And another talking point that emerged from that game was um, question marks over another senior player, the goalkeeper, Leno. Now, Leno has been a stalwart for Arsenal since he's been at the club. He's, he's done some great things and he's still a very good keeper. Um, however, as you alluded to earlier as well, um, the last few weeks, he hasn't been in great form. Um, he was at fault for West Ham's second goal, without a doubt. Uh, some people would say in the previous couple of weeks, his kicking has not been good and he was at fault for at least one of those goals that we conceded in the prior two weeks there. Uh, so some people are saying maybe it's time to give Matty Ryan uh, a go. I mean, we signed in from Brighton on loan and um, we previously had some problems with Renarsson, who a lot of people, <laughs> including yourself, deemed as not to be up to Arsenal standards. So we've gone out and got Matt Ryan. It fell into our lap a bit fortuitously, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and so we're in a situation now that come the end of the season, and uh, he's going to have to be a decision made as to whether he's going to want to stay or whether you want to keep him or what. Um, so yeah. some people are saying, listen, man, Matty Ryan deserves a chance. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would give him a chance. I mean, I don't think I would do it in the Europa League, if I'm honest. Uh, maybe in the Premier League because the Prem, it's kind of fizzling out a little bit. Although we can still push for top six. But listen, Leno, Leno's an interesting one. He, he's not... He's not so much a problem. I don't look at him and think like we need to sell him and, and bring someone else in. I just think 
is he that top, top level goalkeeper, you know, that some of the other sides have got? I think if you're looking at Allison and Edison and people like that, he's not in that category. Um, I think he's a good goalkeeper. He's just not the most commanding for me. Mm. I see him come out for crosses sometimes and he's struggling. Ultimately, Mikel Arteta wants to play out from the back. And dare I say it, we sold a goalkeeper in the summer, uh, you know, mm. who's who's probably better with his feet than Leno is. Um, and I don't know. Leno, to me, is a very, very good shot stopper, although that one against West Ham wasn't. But usually he's a very good shot stopper. I would argue outside of that, he's not an amazing goalkeeper. You know, he's, mm. like I said, he's kicking. He's a bit erratic at times. But in his defence, the only thing that I kind of defend him with is, number one, he saved us a lot of times. And number two is that he hasn't got a great defence in front of him, let's be honest. They kind of expose him a lot of the time. If he had mm. a better defence, then you may see a better goalkeeper. But... Definitely question marks over him in the last five or six weeks. Yeah, absolutely. A couple of conundrums there for the manager. And it'll be interesting to see what he does with regards to both those two places. The striker mm -hmm. position, Abania and Lacazette. And of course, the goalkeeper, Leno and Matty Ryan. OK, thanks for your thoughts on that, bro. Moving on then. So we're in the midst of an international break. Uh, our next game is not until April the 3rd. It's against Liverpool. It's a big game. Now, what I did um, before the show, I had a cursory look at our games coming up. Um, we've got nine games left. So we played 29 games. Uh, obviously, there's 38 games in the season. Uh, as you said earlier, we're ninth, played 29, won 12, lost 11, drawn six. We're ninth in the table. Uh, we've got nine games coming up after the international break. And I'll just go through those quickly because um, I'm going to ask you your thoughts on how you think we can do in those games. So we've got... The first game after a resumption is a home game against Liverpool, uh, followed by an away game against Sheffield United, followed by a home game against Fulham, a home game against Everton, away game against Newcastle, home game against West Brom, away game against Chelsea, away at Crystal Palace, and our final game of the season is a home game against Brighton. Now, I've gone through those games um, mm. and I've selected one. Well, Five of those as very winnable, if not, I would expect Arsenal to win games. I just want your thoughts very quickly. So the first one, Liverpool at home. What's your thoughts there? Do you think we can get a win there? What would you, what would you be expecting anyway? It's a, it's it's very difficult to tell that one because Liverpool have looked very, you know, they've been losing games left, right, and centre. But as an Arsenal fan, you have that pessimistic view that. As bad as they've been, they'll just look like prime Barcelona when they play against us. But now, nah, listen, Liverpool are vulnerable at the back with no Van Dijk and that. It's, I think we need to get at them. I think there's, I think they're beatable. It yeah. will depend on us. I mean, they've still got a lot of quality in attack, but I would like to see Arsenal have a real go at that Liverpool defence. You know, they're, they're weak at centre-back at the moment, but they are still above us in the league as bad as they've been. So... It's a tight one, that, but it's it's winnable if we yeah. play well. I've got that down as winnable, so we'll go through yeah. the rest very quickly because I'm close yeah. the time. Uh, Sheffield United away. Oh, that's got to be a win. That has to be a win. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's got to be a win. They ain't even got a manager right now. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Fulham at home. Yeah, although Fulham have uh, picked up a bit, but like, come on, Fulham at home. We beat them away. We should be winning that. Yeah. Everton at home. That's a tricky one. Um, they're not easy this season. They beat us away. Again, it's one of them games, I think, if we turned up and played well, we could beat them. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got them in the ball as well, but it, yeah. it can go either way. It could, it could even be a draw. Um, yeah. Newcastle away. I mean, they're all over the place. I mean, they're dangerous in attack, but they're really... I mean, I, I think they could possibly go down, you know. I think Fulham might get out of it and, and pull Newcastle into it. Um, you got to be going there. Behind the scenes as well, isn't they? Newcastle. Yeah, we got to be going there and beating them yeah, with no fans as well. I think they suffer without the fans, Newcastle. Yeah, I would be disappointed if we didn't win. We normally do well there anyway as well. Yeah. Um, West Brom at home. 
Oh man, I mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that should be a comfortable victory, man, you know. Mm. Yeah, the Ainsley Maitland Niles Derby, although he probably won't be playing with He it. won't be allowed to play, yeah. no. Um, I should have just said as well that Newcastle would be the Joe Willett Derby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Playing as well, I would have thought. Um, yeah. Okay, so then after that, Newcastle and West Brom, which are two very winnable games, we've got a certain Chelsea away from home. Now, Chelsea mm. are going good guns at the moment, man, so I would imagine yeah. that's going to be quite a challenge. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, no, that's a tough game. We haven't got a great record at Stamford Bridge. And if it was the Lampard Chelsea, I would have been more confident than the Thomas Tuchel one. He's He's yeah. got them very well organised. Kante is on fire again. That would be a tough game, man. It'd be, you know, I'd probably take a draw there. I mean, in the corresponding fixture, we beat them quite comfortably. And I would say that that was a game that actually led to the demise of Chelsea under Lampard and he ended up getting sacked. Yeah. But yeah, as you say, Tuchel's come in and he seems to be doing a great job there. Although some of my Chelsea associates tell me that the football's not great. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit boring. Yeah. Because yeah. you know what fans are like? If you're winning and you're playing like that, they will tolerate yeah, like it. The minute the results start going awry, all of a sudden, people they want you out. Yeah. Something, something different will be coming out of their mouths. But anyway, Crystal Palace away. Now that's. In previous years, it's been quite a challenge for us, isn't it, Crystal Palace? Away? Yeah, again, oh, you know what you're going to get with Palace, isn't it? It's, and it's difficult. They hit you on the break. It's basically the Zaha show, isn't it, every time yeah. you play them? I mean, we drew nil-nil at home. We should have beat them. That's a tricky game again. We haven't got a great record there either, so that's a tough one. Could go either way. Winnable, though. Still winnable. It's winnable. The only thing yeah. I would say about that game, a bit like West Ham, um, Crystal Palace, London Derby, they always seem to turn up. They always seem to be motivated yeah. to play in Arsenal. So yeah. whatever form they're in, you can bet your life that when they play us, they're going to yeah. raise their level. So that would be an interesting game. Um, and our last game, which is at home, uh, that's to Brighton now. I was looking at this game and thinking, yeah, yeah, it should be a rudimentary win. However, we don't want to disrespect Brighton too much because in previous games, they've done quite well against us. And yeah. I would imagine that come that last game of the season, Brighton could well be needing a point or maybe even three. Mm, uh, possibly. They're going to stay in the Premier League. So, you know I mean? That's by no means a cert, is it? I think what will influence our results as well is if we're, obviously, we're hoping we get to the final and win the Europa League. Some of these games will be Thursday night playing. So Arteta may put weaker teams out in some of these games. Yeah. Uh, but no, like you said, there, there's an opportunity to get five, six wins out of them at least. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put down on my list in there that I'm expecting us to get five wins from nine. I don't mm. think I'm being too over you know, no. expectations by seeking that, but that's how I genuinely think that we can get five wins from nine. In fact, I'd be disappointed if we didn't. But yeah. Maybe. So, but will it be enough to guarantee European footballer? Well, it might not be the European football we want because it could be that Europa Conference League, which is like the losers of all losers competition. So, listen, for me, win the Europa League and everything else takes care of itself. The opportunity that we have got to win that, considering the teams that we may or may not play, this is the best. Since we came out of the Champions League a few years ago, this is the best opportunity we've ever had of winning this. Wenger... That year, he ran into Atletico Madrid. They were a little bit too much for us that year. Under Emery, obviously, we know what happened in Baku. But this one, Slavia Prague with potentially Zagreb or Villarreal with maybe Man United, Ajax, Roma in the final. We need to win that Europa League. That will mm. rescue everything. So, mm. but in the Premier League, yeah, we still got to fight for top six. Potentially mm. seventh could still be a Europa League place if one of the top four teams win the FA Cup. So, yeah, maybe seventh. Uh, we've got to be in Europe next season, definitely. Yeah, we've got to be in Europe. But you know what? Um, you say that, and I do agree with much of what you say there, but it also has to be said that we haven't looked overly impressive in some of our European League ties. No. So, for example, even taking the last game, we were beaten at home by Olympiacos. We've been beaten by them at home twice in two years. You know what I mean? Um and let's be honest, man, we didn't look overly impressive against Benfica no. either, did we? So, no. And there are better teams than those two teams that remain in the tournament. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I think we're definitely capable of winning it. But um, whether we actually do or not is another matter. And it goes back to the points we were talking about earlier on this show about the kind of Jekyll and Hyde performances that we're so used to seeing under this team. Can we maintain a level of consistency that is required to win a major competition like this? Um, and yeah. I think the jury is still out. Huh? Mm. You know what? There's one thing about Arsenal, man. Um, in many ways, they're the gift that keeps giving. You just don't yeah. know what team's going to turn out and what performance you're going to get. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we watch with interest. But, yeah, my man, we're coming to the end of the show, man. And yes. as usual, I've enjoyed chopping up with you about all things Arsenal, man. Very interesting to hear your thoughts on why you think the team are mentally still a bit short of where they should be. Um, I noted your points on Aubameyang and Lacazette, Leno. We talked briefly about the nine games that are coming up after the international break. So thanks very much for that, bro. No worries. Your honest and forthright opinions as normal. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what the people watching the show think about those things we spoke about. Tap in, man. Um, please let us know, man. Message us. Continue to send us your messages of support. Smash the like button, man. Share the video. You know what I mean? We appreciate that. Curtis, anything you want to say in closing, bro? No, I'm a big up everyone for supporting the show. Obviously, check out my channel as well, Curtis Shaw TV. You know where I'm at. And uh, big up Laurie, man. The intro's getting better every week. I don't know how you're going to match that. You're going to run out of words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, like I said, man, I'm running out of superlatives, man. But you know yeah. what? You deserve it, man. You come on here every week. You speak your truth. You don't speak things just for to try and curry favour and ingratiate yourself with people. I like the way you keep it 100. And as I said to somebody on another stream, it's very easy to speak your mind, but it's not so easy to speak your truth. So what you'll get, you'll get some people that will say things just to ingratiate themselves with people and to appear a bigger fan than the next guy. Yeah. This show's not about that. You know what I mean? I put the questions to you, you answer them honestly, and uh, we go from there. So yeah, man. But thanks so much, bro. And thanks for all the people for watching. Appreciate that. Keep yourselves well, healthy, COVID-free, and we we'll see you next week. I'm out.